probably loosely affiliated still with the K Leuven. Uh, and I was at the first DevOps days, like Chris said, and I haven't been to any since, but... Uh. Um, so to set the scene a bit, um, the re what is the research environment like? Uh, I was part of a very large research group, uh, 80 researchers working on various uh, system software things, all computer science related. So software engineering, security, networks and systems, various other stuff, uh, some practical, some very theoretical. But in such a big research environment, you have actually have small teams. You have single person silos. People get a personal grant and just work four years on their own on something. Um, they have big problems getting budgets to do things. Uh, you have thing they call tiger teams. It's a, a terrible name, but they came up with, you have a, you're part of a tiger team for this project now and a larger project teams. And these people collaborate a bit. They, they have budgets to buy equipment and things like that. Um, but they also work, again, within their small team with not much collaboration with others within the same research group. So when you need resources for uh, experiments, um, it's often bought for these smaller teams, for the smaller projects. Everybody has their own stash of hardware, equipment, and nobody else can touch it. It's my stuff. Please stay away. Um, when you're in a single person silo, um, you don't have much budget to buy anything. Um, and then you had some labs with equipment and it was mostly desktops out of warranty. So about my PhD, uh, it was about configuration management for distributed systems. So um, maybe something interesting for the Dutch speaking people here. If you work at a, a Flemish university, you also have to translate it to Dutch. Um, so you get something like a raamwerk for geintegreerd configuratiebeheer van gedistribueerde systemen. Nobody knows what you're talking about, but you have to translate it in Dutch. <laughs> so I did something with configuration management and distributed systems, so I needed a lot of equipment to, do, to test things, to validate things, uh, to work out cases, to do benchmarks, to get numbers to, to put in your uh, scientific papers. But I was one of those uh, single person silos. I had a personal grant, I had a small budget, and you could buy, use that budget to buy one server you could use for four years, or you could use that budget to have a laptop and then travel to some conferences. So you had to make a choice. Well, I did my research in a networking lab. So this is the equipment I got. Uh, Dell Optiplex uh, GX1, Pentium 2s, uh, and these very big screens. Now, I'm not that old, actually. I started my PhD in 2008. Uh, this was also in 2008, 2009. Um, and so I had to work with uh, Pentium 2s, quarter of gigabyte RAM, four gigabytes disks, 100 meg NICs. And at some point after two years, I got a lot of gifts. I got a newer version. I got Pentium trees. But <laughs> <laughs> this is what they looked like. And so what I did was I had a lot of hardware, too much. So I started uh, putting some hardware together, uh, stealing RAM from others. And then I got to a point where I could have machines that, that were around half a gigahertz, single core, half a gigabyte of RAM, uh, and two NICs. And then I had these type of stacks in a lab, lots of them. And then you might be wondering, that type of hardware, that's 1998, but it was 2008 when I started, and I was actually still using them in 2011. And so, why was I using this stuff? Because people were hoarding desktops. So everybody would get a new desktop after four years. These desktops were self-managed, so you had machines with Linux, you had machines with Windows. There was one guy who had OpenBSD. Um, and he switched to Linux because he needed to implement something. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you do the math, 10 years, four year, every four years a new desktop, uh, 80 researchers, there were 200 missing desktops that should have been in my lab to do things, but they were nowhere to be found. So where are they? 
And there are researchers, computer scientists, so they weren't building this type of things. Um, there was a lot of shadow IT. Everybody was hoarding their desktops. They had multiple old desktops under their desks, a stack in the middle of the office, a table with number, numerous desktops, uh, things like you can use my old desktops if I can use your old desktops, uh, things like that. Uh, and so it's actually very hard to get things done. Um, there was a lot of hardware, there was enough equipment available, but there wasn't one pool that you could use. The, the machines, there were no backups, there were no <laughs> updates of these machines. Some were running Windows, Windows 2000 in 2010. So without any updates. And all of these machines have a public IP because we're an old it was an old university, they had a very big public range, so everybody got a public IP address. And so with shadow IT, you have no idea what is, what is available. There is no structural services like backups. If, one of, if you're doing experiments on one of these old desktops and this machine just burns down, you lose your work. There, yeah, it's actually quite hell to work on systems like that. So what was one of the causes that everybody was doing this was there are a lot of silos. Um, it's not just devs versus ops in our research group. You can see the researchers as the devs and then you have the ops side, but you're not just a single ops side. You had central IT that was for the entire university. If you would ask them something, you never mentioned that you were using Linux. The only supported system was Windows. Everybody uses Windows, everybody has Windows computers and they only use it for office and for browsing. It's not used to do experiments. Nobody should have administration rights on their own desktops. Certainly not something like Windows. Mac was sometimes tolerated. And they had the local IT. The local IT, they were, they were fighting the central IT all the time. It's the local IT group for uh, the entire of computer science. They also had a lot of history there because they were the first IT group of the university. They also had the first internet, the second internet connection of Belgium, so a lot of history. And they were constantly fighting the central IT and trying uh, for everybody to have a Unix machine, uh, a Linux machine, Windows out of the question. And then if you would ask something as uh, a representative of a research group, they were also always fighting to get to a point where you have a standard offering. Um, they don't want it to, to proliferate all the different solutions too much. So if you ask them something, they would always help, but it would take a long time. Uh, it would take, if you ordered a server uh, to use for some experiment, it took three to four months before that server was ready to use. So most researchers just didn't ask anything anymore. They just try to solve their problems on their own, buy machines, put them under their desk and use them. So everybody had different goals for what they try to optimize and they communicate through email and tickets. Uh, I've never been in a meeting where all these four parties are, are on the same table. It's always two parties together and then emailing to the others. So if you want to get to do experiments with a lot of IT equipment, it's not easy to get these things done. So at this point in time, I was no longer really in a silo anymore. Uh, I was a researcher, but I had some operational skills. I could set up uh, a st an, an application server and a database server and make these things work so uh, somebody else would just have to deploy their, their test application in it. And when you have these skills, you tend to get rather popular to work with. Um, so I started collaborating with other people and projects, I would use their research prototypes as case studies for the research I was doing. And it was mostly Java and op application servers. And for me, the tipping point where it really was clear we needed to do something different was uh, I had to use a JAE application uh, as a case study. And it was JBL 7 and I had to deploy it on these Optiplex computers. I had a quarter of gigabyte RAM, and at that point you needed four, eight gigabytes of RAM just to deploy this. Uh, so it was in 2011, by the way. So there was really <laughs> no way to do this. Um, 
So at the same time, others who, who faced, were faced with these problems, they would just buy one or more beefy servers, uh, buy a server with uh, 10 cores, 16 cores, and then uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM. And then uh, it was used for a single research project. Nobody else could use them because they really needed uh, these servers for their research project, but it was peak usage. They used it uh, one month and then two or three months the, the server was unused and then again they needed it. And they were placed in the local uh, data center called the computer saal because it used to be really a computer saal where there was one very big room where there was one single server, a VAX, where you had terminals and people could sit there, so it's still called computer saal. And the local IT group uses uh, Ubuntu as the operating system, and they use the long-term support version. What does that mean if you have such a managed server to do your research? If you buy your server in May 2014, you get an operating system that's one month old. You get Ubuntu 14.04. You would buy the server two months earlier, you would get an operating system which is almost two years old. So if you're doing research, you often want to use with rather new, you want to work with rather new software, uh, rather new tools. And so uh, you would ask uh, the central IT, uh, I need a newer version of software X. You would get a reply that software is not in the Ubuntu repo, and then you would say, yeah, but I really, really need it. And then the IT staff would say, don't worry, we installed KSSC. And you can compile it yourself. We increased your quota, but please put it in the no backup directory so it wouldn't get on backup, because otherwise it would cost too much. So that was also a big problem. Some people were able to really compile a lot of uh, an entire application server, uh, MongoDB, other storage tools themselves, but others ran into problems and just gave up. Yeah, that's the only reaction you can have when uh, you get an email like that. And so one of the last big complications was also you have a lot of different network zones in a research group or the computer science department. You have the DMZ, you have the intranet, you have a lab network zone and you have experiments. And depending on what type of experiment or research you were doing, the server was placed in one of these single network zones. And only there the server could be used. When you needed to move it to another ne network zone, it needed to be reinstalled and would again have to wait two weeks, one month, two months. Uh, some might say virtualization could, uh, could solve this, but you would still you would have a managed system and then you'll get root access on the virtual machines, but it's still no solution for the networking problem and also not for storage problems. And so the solution that we came up with uh, is introduce self-service. Use something, uh, in our case, uh, it would be set up a pool of hardware, isolate users from each other. We have people working with malware, uh, do setting up honeypots to, to detect certain uh, uh, trends in, in security research, and others would be doing systems research, uh, imp implementing middleware stacks, network stacks, things like that, and you would want to isolate it from each other. But you would let users and teams create their own servers, networks, change firewall rules, use multiple network zones, also offer services to others. You have developed something, uh, you set it up, and others can use that service over the network. And the solution for that is cloud. Uh, may seem very uh, simple solution. Um, and there are two types of cloud. You have public cloud, it's very easy. You, you, you take your credit card and you're actually ready to start. But you're bounded by their acceptable use policy. And so that means when you're scanning the entire internet for malware, you're setting up honeypots. Amazon is not very keen on that. Um, it's also very hard to predict cost. Um, you can predict in some sense, you can predict the cost, but for example, one of the experiments we considered doing on uh, Amazon required to download four terabytes of data from Amazon. Over the course of three years, it would have costed more than buying four or five very beefy servers that could run, each of these servers could run the ex entire experiment. And the data is also not on premise. So some ex some research is done with data from companies which are under which is under an NDA, and so it's hard to move that to the cloud. And Amazon is also not that very cheap. It gives you a lot of flexibility, but it's still rather expensive. 
So we moved into a uh, private cloud. It's, it's harder to set up and operate, but we would have uh, an upfront cost and a hosting cost, which is, by the way, shared for the entire university. So for this case, it's actually uh, only the upfront cost and the maintenance cost of the system. And for research projects, it's often much more simple to have the upfront cost instead of a recurring cost every month. Uh, it would also allow us to have better integration with our own infrastructure. One of the big downsides of the solution is its fixed size. So if you have a very big experiment coming up, you would have to start buying servers on time and get it integrated into your private cloud. So we, we looked at some cloud systems. Uh, we looked at Open Nebula, um, CloudStack, and OpenStack, and eventually chose uh, to start with OpenStack. We started with a single server and OpenStack Folsom, if I remember correctly, in 2012. We added two servers uh, two months later. A while later, we added again two servers, migrated from local storage to shared storage. We added again three servers. We upgraded the network from one gig to four times one gig. We added a NetApp filer to store experimental data that would be needed to be accessed from multiple uh, virtual machines at the same time. We added an SSD caching layer, we migrated to 10 gig, we added eight servers. Uh, servers, not server servers. Um, and while we did, all, we did all these changes to that same environment, we actually kept the same interface for the users of that private cloud. They would be able to keep their virtual machines, keep their networks. Sometimes they had a day of downtime, but their tooling that they wrote to do their experiments, to set up their experiment, everything stayed the same. Um, and most changes were very transparent. Nobody ever knew that we added servers, which is actually very different from the situation we had before, even with the managed servers, because once in a while, when the server was out of warranty and they would buy a new server, everybody had to migrate. Some people were too busy, they were writing their PhD, so migrations took forever. For people who are interested in the more technical side, our current setup is we have uh, two uh, controllers. We have one management server. We have two different clusters. We have one cluster that's used for performance experiments where virtual machines or, or the CPUs of the virtual machines are mapped one-on-one -on, -one on physical uh, CPUs. So you get near physical hardware performance without much jitter. Um, while still have the benefits of self-service uh, and virtualization. And then we have a more general purpose cluster, uh, which runs all, which runs most virtual machines. Uh, it also combines the storage system. Uh, everything is on two times 10 gig. And then we also have a big net up to store experimental data. Now we have the self-service model, but still now we have a big virtual infrastructure to maintain and to set up because we have three different uplinks. So depending on which experiment and what users are doing in experiment, they have to be in a different network zone. So sometimes students do their master thesis on the setup, so they shouldn't be able to access something on the intranet. They shouldn't be able to use public IP addresses. Others are crawling the internet constantly. They have to use a different network zone, so the traffic will not originate from the KLIV, but just from a, a very small range of IP addresses. So uh, some big provider wouldn't think that the entire KLIV is DDoSing uh, them, and then would block them. Um, each user gets their own virtual sandbox. So we enforce quotas, but every user gets their own quota uh, and can do whatever they want within that quota. Um, Team projects also get their own project. Uh, security groups, so the firewall rules are by default closed, but users can open them up themselves within OpenStack. And every network can access every other, other network if the firewall rules allows it. So users can freely collaborate without having to send an email, open a ticket, or whatever. Um, and they can access this entire virtual infrastructure through SSH or by setting up a VPN and they can also access every network, every virtual machine that's inside that infrastructure. This was rather challenging to manage uh, and now I'm going to 
show a bit about how we did it, and it's also uh, the, the tool, the product that we are developing as a spin-off from the KO Leuven. Um, for the people get making the accounts, managing that virtual infrastructure, we build actually a, a dashboard with our tool that would allow them just to enter an email address, a username, uh, specify which types of networks that these users can use, and also uh, the third octet of the IP address um, that this user has. And so we have a very um, uh, regular IP addressing scheme, so you see from the IP address in which network zone you are, and the third octet is always the same for each user, independently in which uh, network zone they are. We made a configuration model for this. Uh, we specify actually an interface, how a new a project look, what a project looks like. Um, we have some relations to other parts of the entire configuration model. And then we uh, create, created implementations for this. Uh, such a pers personal project consists of uh, a new project in OpenStack, a new user. This user uh, gets a number of roles, gets access to OpenVPN, and a user on the SHH access server is also created. And then, depending on the network zone, we also create uh, a dedicated network for them. Uh, so this is when they get a public IP, when they can use public IP addresses. When they're in the lab, they get a dedicated router. Um, so they have their own router to which they can connect other networks as well and set up more elaborate experiments. Um, and then also configure all the routing within OpenStack. We also have an experimental network zone. It's very similar to the uh, public networking zone. It just depends on, uh, it just uses another uplink, uh, another IP range. And then based on what we, uh, what a user enters in the dashboard, we select these implementations dynamically and create different uh, environments for each of these users. Um, so we, we made a very simple interface to something that sets up a very complex environment. And this is a snapshot from uh, a few months ago of this environment. Every circle uh, represents a router in this open stack, every oval is a network, and every square box is a virtual machine that was booted at that time. So setting something up like this, uh, maintaining something like this uh, for the IT group of computer science department would take a lot of time, it would take a lot of communications, a lot of meetings to set this up. Now every researcher can just uh, set this up by his own. So while doing this, while migrating everybody or trying to migrate as much people as possible to this uh, environment, we learned quite some lessons. Um, and this is where we actually get to the point where a lot of these lessons or, or uh, tactics and, and types that came that also were uh, mentioned in the first presentation. One of the things I learned was uh, to change something, to set up something like this, Getting budget, getting money for the first server was much harder than getting budget for the last six servers that we bought. Although the budget was six times more, it was just something that was already being used, which a lot of people uh, had value uh, valued. Uh, and getting budget for that was very easy. Uh, for the first server, for the first server, we we uh, had a lot of meetings, and I think it took six months to convince uh, the people who, who, who have the budgets to buy that server. It was also very important to get support from local IT, convince them, yes, we're setting something up that's more complex than what you're doing now, but it will liberate you from a lot of emails, a lot of tickets, a lot of whining from end users, researchers. Uh, so in the end, you'll win by doing this. Uh, we also started very small. We just moved in a small team with I think five or six users, no more than that. Uh, and then gradually we rolled it out to more users and, and the project uh, started making um, uh, advertise itself within our research group. People were chatting, yeah, but I'm using uh, the cloud environment and it goes a lot faster. Maybe you should ask a rec account as well. Uh, we never also never whined about increasing quota, uh, things like that. If somebody needed more quota, we just gave them more quota. Uh, we started... Documentation is important, and actually the documentation sucks for this project, but the documentation there is, 
is enough documentation to get them uh, to get them started. So it's a bit like crack dealer documentation, just enough to get them hooked, and then they will have to find out for themselves. In the first two years of the project, I gave a lot of demos, a lot of meetings where I just demoed the product and showed this uh, the project. This is what you can do. It's so easy to start virtual machines. It's so easy to set up an entire lab environment. Um, we also did a lot of training and uh, uh, pro bono services. So just go to somebody and say, uh, I heard you're doing things on your local laptop and on some desktops under your desk. Can I set this up for you on our uh, cloud environment? And you'll see it's a lot easier to use. Uh, just, just do the work for them to convince them uh, that they could use it. Um, and to to get back to the presentation, the first presentation of the day, uh, there were also the, the what was the name, the lunatics? Uh, there are some of those as well who had their hardware, which would allow them to use it much more efficiently. They could use a lot more hardware if they would put it in the pool of compute servers. I tried to convince them many times, but yeah, a lesson that I learned, don't try to convince the lunatics, just ignore them. Let them do, uh, let them do their thing. What's also very important for a cloud environment, especially for a private cloud, it should look elastic. Although the capacity is infinite, uh, you will, for end users, it should seem that it's infinite. Um, why is this important? In the beginning of this year, there was not enough capacity. We warned that we needed more servers, but I think administrative reasons, it took too long to add them to the system. And so people started hoarding virtual machines again, because some people go, went through the experience that they uh, deleted a virtual machine. A week later, they needed a new virtual machine, tried to start one, and OpenStack would say, no capacity left. So it's very important when you do something like this with self-service is that it always works. They always are able to get the stuff they request and so they will um, delete it again when they don't need it anymore because they know when I need it, I can get it back. And so capacity management and planning is very important. Otherwise, you will encourage hoarding again and you're back to where you started in some sense. And then actually one of the biggest problems we still have, the issues that we face is uh, we have quotas and they help to, to waste resources. But we have also... We also have a lot of abandoned virtual machines. Somebody boots two virtual machines and forgets. Um, it's very hard to know if, if somebody is still using that virtual machine. You send emails to users. Um, your virtu there is not enough capacity. Can you delete all virtual machines you're not using anymore? Um, almost no virtual machines were deleted. After a while, because it so, got so bad, we just sent an email, we're going to shut down all virtual machines, and when you need them, just boot them again. Three months later, uh, still 50 virtual machines are still shut down. These users abandoned them, but they just don't care. Uh, they stay there, and they're wasting resources. It's also very hard to distinguish. Some people do something useful with 50 virtual machines, and some others have one virtual machine that's just trashing, it takes a lot of resources from the cluster, but it's not useful. Um, so what we're working on is, is better monitoring. So uh, we can detect anomalies and we can also do public shaming. Just say, uh, these are the 10 users that use the most resources. There are users that, can use, that are using them uh, like it should, uh, but there are also users in that list that, that are just wasting resources. And so that's actually the end of my presentation. Um, if somebody has questions, uh, please ask them. Do we need a mic? Actually, I wanted to comment on the resource accounting. Um, one strategy that seems to work very well is if you attach some kind of cost to running a virtual machine, even if it's just a virtual cost, yeah. and email the reports to the people because then they can't forget that they run the machine because they incur this virtual co cost. Yeah. 
Um, virtual cost can be something like public shaming, for example. Yeah, it's something we thought about, but but you're also giving a good hint, actually. Um, the, why we didn't want to associate a virtual cost is that then you get to the point where uh, it, you will have to start, yeah, but what is the budget that you can use? But just sending out the reports might be uh, already enough to trigger people to start uh, uh, releasing resources, just that they know I wasted a thousand euros last month. Uh, yeah, that's a good, uh, good suggestion. Any more questions? All right, then it's time for a sponsor pitch and our next speaker. <laughs> 